Hello, and welcome to Coding Coens, where together we're going to explore the world of software, get better jobs, and change the world. My name's Ian Carroll, and I have kept my voting sticker very pristine on several different shirts. Uh, by the way, uh, now is the season for voting, as in the now as in the only time really ever where it's super duper 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 gonna matter. So if you haven't voted, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, now, uh, that being said, um, I have a guest today and we're going to explore some uh, game development together. Uh, my guest is Joseph Limbaugh. Uh, Joseph is an improviser and a game designer. Uh, you can check out his work on postcardgames.com and in connection with the game Gatefall, which you can currently find and the expansion on Kickstarter as Lost in the North Woods. Uh, he teaches improv to lawyers, actors, and at the New York Film Academy in Los Angeles. Joseph, welcome to the show. Let's, uh, let's start talking a little bit about game development, because you were, in here, you're a game designer, but, I oh, hold on a second. I just realized something. This whole time, uh, you've been muted. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, let me let me uh, ask you that question again um, about um, game development. Um, your thoughts about game development in board games versus game development in software. Right. Well, it's they're very similar because uh, you're developing systems and you're you know the, and you want the players to make interesting decisions, fun decisions. I think that's foremost in your mind, and you want a balance is important. Like you, it's you'd want a system that the players can't break. You know what I mean? So I think that 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 is something that exists both in board games and in computer games. Like you want you know, I've been a, I've been a play tester for computer games. I used to work at Activision down in the dungeon. You know, okay. as a play tester, it was one of my first jobs in Los oh, really? Angeles. And yeah, and it's like, that's actually kind of a fun job because you play games and your whole job is to break them, you know, so that they cannot be broken by other people. But you try to like exploit the game and find the edges of it. And, and it's it's really important to have good play testers for any game to make sure that, you know, that it is, it, it isn't easily breakable by the end, the end user. That's right? Also very important if you're putting together a website that, you know, gets people uh, pizza delivered or something, you right. know. Uh, That's funny because I'm having not pizza, but Italian food delivered in just a moment. So <laughs> we might get interrupted. We might get interrupted by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's uh, so, yeah, I mean, like one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, like in my job as a web developer, that's not really developing games, but I'm thinking of the the way in which um, a user will experience this piece of software um, so that it is intuitive for them to figure it out, not easy to break, simple to them, makes sense, and fun and rewarding to continue to use. Um, and I don't think that those, those things are something that should only live for you know, concerns for video games. Absolutely. Yeah. I, one of my uh, like gurus like um, uh, in game design um, is Chris Crawford. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. I haven't. I, if I have. I wonder if I have one of his books here. I might have something. Yes. Oh, I do. This is um, actually I should loan this to you. This is Understanding Interactivity. <gasps> oh, cool. Yeah. This is a great book because he um, I don't know. He's like he's like an old curmudgeon. He will even say that he's an old curmudgeon, uh -huh. but like that is probably like one of the best books I've ever read on on interactivity and like a design of user interface. Like it's just it kind of lays out. It describes what interactivity is first of all, which is a word that gets thrown around all the time. But like his description, like his his um, just his um, explanation of what interactivity is is priceless. Like it's it's oh that's a great way of looking at it, you know. Um, that's a great way of describing what interactivity is because a, a lot of people get confused like interactivity, you know, like movies aren't interactive, right? That's a thing. That's a thing that is great about computers is they're interactive. But right. what does that mean? What is interactive? Like, I mean, you know, this pencil's interactive. I'm interacting with it, but like, he's like, okay, well, this is what interactivity is. And this is why computers 
are different than all the other types of medium. And why people get this wrong is because computers are interactive and this is what interactivity is and how to best design it. Um, anyway, he's, he's like an old curmudgeon and he's been trying for years to develop interactive storytelling, which is like of, uh, you know, and people, once again, that's another bu buzzword that people talk about all the time is having narrative in a computer that is interactive narrative, kind of like doing what we do as improvisers. You know what I mean? Like creating a story in real time in a computer. No one's really done that. People, people say they've done it, but they're really just do using the same technology over and over again. You know, right. it's like a branching tree or whatever. Right, um, yeah, I mean, you can only get so far with branching. Um, and that's because, um, and, and I'm, the perfect example is Dungeons and Dragons, right? Um, or at least I'm gonna say tree? it's a perfect example. Um, or it's an example of a, of a game system, but I, sure. you mean is okay. of a branching system? Let, let's, uh, at least the way that I play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, or for that matter, I could say the same thing about any uh, tabletop RPG, which is that as a player, I can say I want to do anything at all. Anything I can think of can happen, and there's going to be a cause and effect, um, and to there's an interactivity to that, but the interactivity is with a person who's the game master for that. And that person right. is going it's, to be interpreting what you're giving them and then giving you something back. They can back let you go anywhere, though, right? right? Like, if I'm a person, I'm the game master, you can go off the rails off to wherever, and I can, yeah. like, design it out for you. But a computer can't do that, really, right? Right, exactly. You can design it on the, in, on the fly, right there on the moment, as, like, oh, I wasn't expecting them to do that, <laughs> but we can work with that. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, like, branching actually doesn't get very far even for something like chess. Um, chess will get you, like, there are more possible, if you were to build the entire game tree for chess, like, every, you know, option followed by every possible option that comes in after that, uh, there are more games that are possible of chess than there are atoms in the universe times milliseconds since the Bing Bang. But it is something that a computer can calculate. Like computers can now beat human beings at chess. They so can, I mean, they can't they calculate all the possible. They can't calculate all the possibilities. But it's it's a problem they can at least approach. Whereas I would say the problem of creating storytelling is even more complicated than that. I yeah, think it's it is. It is massively more complicated than that than, because this has chess. rules of like there's a this and then there's a that. There's there's a there there's a call and a response, and it's just call response yeah. call response. But with storytelling yeah that's even more complicated um, anyway that's something chris crawford has been trying to it's a nut he's been trying to crack for decades he created this system called storytron and and had a bunch of people working on it um and just wasn't happy with the results and and it wasn't yeah he's he's been trying to trying to solve that problem for a long time so he's a really interesting guy but yeah like i said an old an old curmudgeon he's got he would always say like you know if if there's a problem with software that you should shoot the programmer like it's like if you if you as an end user are confused then the programmer has failed yeah and his 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 hyperbolic response would be shoot that person that person who wrote that code because it's their fault it's not your fault yeah everything should be clear um yeah. and uh, a lot of times that <laughs> you know just to go a step further and say like yeah it, it is our responsibility as software engineers to write code that other people can use it doesn't matter whether it compiles or how clever we are that's not the reason why software is written software is written for someone else and if you fail to actually write the software for someone else then uh you're you're doing a terrible terrible job i mean it's sort of like writing a love letter but you know all you're doing is focusing on the grammar and the penmanship um like you know you can feel that <laughs> if someone does that <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh, like the perfect example is anytime there's a menu item that's grayed out there should always be a tooltip that says why it's grayed out every single time at no point should i should i see an action that i want to perform be unable to perform it but not know why but that happens all the time i'll go into a menu and it stuff's grayed out and it's like you need to let me know why it's grayed out because i don't like you know especially with like modern software there's like so many things in menus now it's like you know. a mystery it's like hmm i want to get there but the bridge is out hmm the bridge is how, out yeah. how do i now the game is you know how to order this pizza 
but the bridge is out. But this is not a fun game to play. This is just an irritating game to play, and it just makes me feel like a lot of people get get the feeling like software like has a life of its own. It's like, oh, it's computers. It's like, no. Every single thing that's in a computer, someone's had to sit down and write. There's nothing in a computer that someone did not write. They might have written a program that writes a program. That's possible, but, you know, yeah. It is uh, it is the responsibility of the developer to write for people. It looks like your pizza may be here. Or yeah. your, uh, your Italian food. Or is there a complication? I don't know. Um, hopefully, um, I think someone's taking care of it. Okay, well, that's good. Let me just, you know what? I can also look at the camera. Let's see, well, there's no one there, so hopefully that got delivered. Hopefully. Anyway. Uh, well, um, maybe, so we're gonna work on some Unity stuff, right? Um, yes. And, all right, I've, I've never, I, I have opened up the Unity program like once. Tell me what is Unity and what does it do and why, why, why should I uh, consider it as a tool? Oh, those are all good questions. Well, Unity is a really popular game uh, development uh, platform, right? It's like really popular. I think the two big ones are Unity and the Unreal Engine. Those are kind of the two okay. big platforms. Now, Unity technically, like it's called Unity because you can... Um, uh, because you can um, uh, develop for many different systems, like you can you can compile for like Mac, you can compile for PC, Android. I think like PlayStation. I think like you know it does. The, it, you can set the parameters to compile for an iPhone. You know, um, it is it is that's why I think it's it's pretty popular. And also, it's it's free for like students. So there's like or really anyone. I think if you're like if you're like um, you're not unless you're planning on making a hundred thousand dollars i think you the, the platform is free to mm -hmm. install and use and it's and there's a big user base so and that's one of the things that draws me to it oh uh, yeah because yeah. You, you need you a can, big user you can, base yeah you can look up any error and there'll be someone who's dealt with it you know what i mean mm -hmm. um now it is there are downsides it is uh very complicated you know they um and a bit kludgy like there are definitely some weird you know, it's a, it's a huge, complicated, gigantic beast. So there are definitely like occasionally you'll run into something where it's like, why is this why is this error popping up? And you go and you look on the forums, and they're like, oh yeah, they, this is an error. We, Unity itself, it has nothing to do with you. And here's the workarounds. <laughs> you know right. I mean? So there's that, but mm, that's yeah. you know, and it, it uses Visual Studio, like it's it's connected to it. I, I I'm not sure. I think you might be able to use a different text editor now or different but uh, generally you, you're using visual studio so if you don't like visual studio and i mean uh, i don't know i it's it's a fine editor i mean people, it's not my editor of like choice it. but you know i mean yeah. an editor is an editor is an editor um so. right well i mean i just had to re because i haven't run unity in a while and i just started it for this and then when I pulled up Visual Studio, like it took a long time to start. Which right. Is pretty, pretty yeah. Normal. Yeah. That's and 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 then when it started, it's like, oh no, you don't get any Visual Studio yet. Your license is old. Like it gave me several warnings that I had to like hoops I had to jump through, right. which were just like, like I have a free license, so I just clicked on no, it's not, and it's like okay, okay, you're good. So, and then I had to like sign into Microsoft or whatever. But yeah. right now, that's the difference between um, uh, proprietary tools such as Unity and Visual Studio and the world of open source. In open source, um, there's frequently, there, 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 there can be a lot of bugs in open source. But the difference is that the, the hood of your car isn't welded shut. You can actually open up the hood, go into the gears, fix the thing you need to fix, fix it for everybody, and then you're good to go. Um, and you've contributed to everybody, you've solved the problem, there's no workaround, you've actually f solved it, um, and uh, you also don't have the problem with the licensing and other things like that, but because the fact that this is developed purely in shop by Microsoft, I believe, for Visual Studio, I'm not sure if they own Unity. I think that might be somebody else. I don't think they do. No, Vi no Unity has like a contract with, I think, with Microsoft to use Visual okay. Studio, but yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, but the code is, is C is C sharp. Like that's the unity code is all C sharp generally. Yeah. Um, 
uh, they did, you used to be able to do, it was either C sharp or JavaScript, I think there was, uh -huh. you had an option between like, it was, I think it was JavaScript. Was it JavaScript? Python, I don't remember. Maybe Python. Actually, maybe yeah, it was Python. You had a, you had an option, but now I think it's just C sharp. Yeah, uh, um, they which want, is one they, of the reasons why they use Visual Studio. So. But C sharp is open source because it's a programming language, and uh, a closed source programming language is not a great idea. Um, not that people haven't tried, um, but uh, it is also owned by Microsoft, um, or at least that's who's maintaining it primarily. Is so uh, yeah. Not, not too surprising, but C Sharp is a fine language. Uh, it's very similar to Java. It's typed. Um, so uh, it also, you could write unit tests for it, which is kind of cool. I don't know if that's really what done. What are unit tests? So instead of, so it's a way of handling uh, low level bugs in a program. Uh, so instead of uh, having like play testers find the bugs and then you fix those bugs. What you do is you write unit tests for each little tiny bit of code that you're writing. You validate with 100% accuracy that it does exactly what you say it's going to do with this test that runs that little bit of code, just that part, make sure it works. And then you have mm. like hundreds or you know, even thousands of those um, as you're working that validate that all of these little tiny issues, they're all solved. They're still working. Right. If you change something, you didn't accidentally break something over there. You've got these unit tests to prove that you did not break anything that you're already testing. Oh, cool. Um, All right. Which, I think I understand that. Yeah. So what that does is it means that your play testers can focus on game feel. Um, they can focus on um, uh, like you know the 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 aesthetics. They can focus on like really obscure bugs. Um, so. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, you're really trying to develop your software with your game testers uh, if you don't use any tests. I'm not sure how much the gaming industry uses unit tests, though. It might depend on the shop. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I definitely know that testers are working. Like, they will play a, the game before it's finished. Like, oh, that's yeah. kind of the whole point. Like, yes. they, they will be playing, you know. And they ought to. Uh, but to take the load yeah. off of them and not need, you don't need them except for things that a human can do, um, you know, or that you can squirrel out that way. Um, they're still very useful and, and they ought to, you, you ought to use game testers. Uh, you ought to use QA people. Um, but um, when, but you can give them less work and give them more valuable work to do if you use unit testing. Um, and you make sure your code base is clean that way. Um, uh, but you've got Unity set up, right, on your computer? I do, yeah. All right, you want to share your yeah. screen? Sure. All right, let's see how this goes. OK, so I'm seeing. Oh, hello? Ian, you just you disappeared from me. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, you're back. You're back. You Hold disappeared. On. I need to put my headphones back in. OK. Uh, that was a little uh, thing with the camera. Um, I forgot to plug it in. It's running off of batteries. And that was when the battery died. <laughs> Always solving technical problems in this world we live in. Yeah. Well, I have a pre-flight checklist that allows for me to do some unit testing before this happens so that when something does break, it's pretty obvious what it is. So well, sorry that's to cool. leave you in the lurch for a second there. No, that's fine. I was worried. Um, can you uh, see my, my screen now? Yes, I can. Yeah. So, so um, I, first, let on? me just say that I'm not, I'm not like a... I'm not like a trained coder, so I probably have broken all sorts of good practices that most <laughs> most people who write code would like to follow. This is not, you know, this is I, my whole thing is like I want to make something that works, and so that's what I that's what this is. And Unity actually is great for that because you can get some stuff happening almost right away just by sitting down and building some stuff. That's one of the cool things about it. Cool. Um, 
So uh, this is this is Unity. Uh, these are the different sections. This is the hierarchy over here. So these are like kind of all of the objects in my scene. Like if I click on one of these, you'll see that this ring is selected. That's the other ring. Um, some of this stuff is old and probably isn't active. Okay. Um, and then uh, yeah, so these are various things within within the game you can and you can kind of you know move around and this is so it has a very much like almost 3d modeler um approach to how you know how you you do stuff in unity so you have kind of this place where you're building objects in here um and then you have kind of the objects you built over here cool. um and uh down here is the i forget what this is called the project manager i think but this is these are kind of like all of the different um all the different objects you have, you know, and scripts and textures that you have imported, you know, audio assets, basically all the different assets you would need for your, for your project. And, and if you're smart, you've organized them um, well. Uh, I probably have not organized them well. I'm sure, you know, that I, there's probably versions of those. Um, and then like, if you click on a specific object, like you can either click on it over here or like over here is this ring, which is, these are just um, environmental. They don't really do anything in the game. They're just environmental objects. You okay. can go over here to the object inspector and this has all of the different, like you can see here's the transform of the object, like it's position, rotation and scale, all of the different kind of elements of that object, all the things attached to it, attached to an object. Um, and most of those are things that Unity gives you to put on, like your, you know, like the animator. An animator is something that you use to, to animate an object, um, like the the shaders that show what the object looks like, um, all of that. Uh, but like if I go, let's see, to take a look at the player arc, which is kind of the player object, you can see over here in the inspector that has scripts attached to it. So that is how, that is where in Unity you, you write scripts, is you have scripts that are attached to the object itself. Um, so you okay. can like add a, add a component. These are components, by the way. You can add a component and then you can add like a new script component. Uh, and then, you know, one of these scripts will appear. And if you, if I go like, this is the name of the, this is the actual script here, Over, Overdroid Orbit. If I click on this, it will pop the script up. And this is the script that is connected to that. This is looking uh, more familiar to me at this point now that I'm seeing text. Yeah, now that you see text, you you can see what's going on because um, this is this is where the actual coding happens. This is the C sharp yep. that is behind all of this. Um, so I you forget. use these scripts uh, when you want to do something that's super custom. That's not necessarily what uh, the other parameters that are in your graphical user interface would allow you to do, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you can see I'm setting up some variables here, uh, speed and smooth. And there's a um, 6F and a 3F. Are those, are you using, now F in this case, uh, what does the 6F mean? Um, you know what, it's been a while since I've been in Unity, so I'm not sure I totally remember what that means. But if we go back to here, you can see that, I think it might have something to do I don't, yeah, I don't I'm totally seeing those numbers, that. six and three. But yeah, so these are like, I can change these numbers. Um, one of the values, the cool things about this is I can change these numbers. Um, and they're public, if they're public numbers, I can change them and then that'll change, that'll change the behavior in the game. Oh, okay, hold on a second. Could you change that to 6.2? Um, uh, 6 I don't know. Okay. I was gonna be clever, but I failed. Um, and then uh, if you change to 6.2 for the speed, if you go to the script, does that change the script also? It sh I don't think it should. It, I don't think it'll change the script, but I might be wrong. No, see the script is the same. Okay, so the script is not generated by, the, uh, by Unity. No. Okay, so I'm nope. seeing that you've got, a, uh, you've got a speed here, 6F. I'm, maybe the F in this case means float. I don't think that you're using. I think it does. Decimal. I think it. I think it just means float. I think it means. Um, yeah, I think it just. It's definitely not hexadecimal. I think it means float. Uh, it's just a, a quick way of. I think of writing float without putting point zero 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 or whatever. It just automatically casts it to a float. I think for whatever reason, uh, I had to do that. I don't know why. Hmm. I, yeah, I wrote. That... By the way, I worked on this game like 
years ago, literally yeah. years ago, and since I've looked, since I've worked on it. So some of the stuff I don't. And Unity has been updated multiple times. So some of the stuff, like, um, probably is not written the way it should be written. Well, uh, we're going to find out Unity. what is and is not written in a decent way based off of you know how many questions we have and what kinds. Because yeah. I imagine you from three years ago understood this very well. Uh, yeah, I think I did. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time working on it. Um, yeah. So let's uh, go back to the um, to Unity. So one of the cool things now about Unity, uh, you can see here, like that's if I click on scene, that scene, then you can click on game. The game isn't running, so it doesn't really look like much. But that's what it will kind of look like from the camera view. If I hit this play button right here, then the game will run. Um, so. If I do this, then we will actually see, oh, here we go. Yeah. So this is the game. This is the game running right now. Um, is you, It has There's spawned your... this thing in the middle. I can use my keyboard and mouse to kind of move around the outside of this sphere, which by the way, this game, this is a game that I, this is like an update of a game that I wrote like in early to, in the early 2000s, I wrote a game for a for a, a competition call, it was a dark basic game competition, um, and that's where the title, that's where the name Overdroid comes from too, because it, it was supposed to be an update of a game called Paradroid, which was on the Commodore sixty four years ago, like in the in the eighties, um, and this is only part of it. Like in the in the Paradroid game, you're this robot that takes over other robots, right? Okay. You go into their brain and you take them over, and then there's this little mini game where you have to like shoot their little circuits to, to like create to, to take them over it's like a little mini game so this was kind of a 3d version of that mini game that i created this is a long long explanation of where overdroid comes from and where um also kind of the, the name of this game would have been overdroid but I, there's no robots obviously this is just you kind of taking over the robot on the inside of their brain so if i here's the thing you want to turn it's kind of like a little puzzle and this is this is like level one so the puzzle is really simple but what you want to do is turn all these red cubes to blue cubes so if i shoot these cubes um and here's the thing this is the this is the puzzle part of it see how there's these lines connecting these cubes here yeah if i shoot this cube it flip flops it toggles all the cubes uh -huh. right so you have to like you to get them all blue you have to like do this Right, because it only will it'll only toggle the adjacent cubes, and then if I do all of the cubes blue, then it'll like this is this is kind of as far as I got. It'll it'll create, and as you keep doing this, it'll get more and more difficult. Like the the cubes will become the puzzles will become more complicated, and I think I can is, switch it to a higher level so we can see like a, a is, more complicated puzzle. But are those com are the puzzles are they being generated or did you? They design are generated. Each? Okay, that's really no. Kind there's of cool. In fact, there's a recursive script I wrote. I don't. I will have. We, maybe we can look at that if you want to. But there, I wrote a recursive script that will la designs the puzzle that I was really proud of. I think it's like the first time I ever wrote a yeah, recursive well, let's, script. Yeah, let's see that. Um, um, first of all, and this is this is a cool thing too. You can I can like pause the game. I can escape out of it and then go look at stuff. Like I can go and and I can change things. Like I can change this number in the middle of the game. Right, and now when I go works. in here, the speed is slower. Like I'm moving slower around the sphere. Yeah, I can. Ch that's one of the cool things about Unity is I can go in and like alter oh, this stuff man. while you know to see like how does it work? Because it's you're an artist, you're building this game. You want to be able to change that stuff and so see. So as a you developer, know. you're also kind of play testing in order to see how it works for all those things that you can't unit test. You can't uh, like this isn't a, a a bit of pure logic that you know, either works or it doesn't. This is something that's like, this is all about look and feel. Um, yeah, which so. is really important for a game. And I yeah. think like if you are, a, if you are a game developer, like you generally will get very good at your game. Um, you, you know, by, by playing it over time, just cause you, you spent a lot of, you spent a lot of development cycles, like, oh, playing the game, changing the code, playing the game, changing the code, playing and the game. And that's why you need the play testers also, because you can get lost in playing the game the way that you play it and miss other ways of playing the game. Yup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll stop this now. And you wanted to see, I'm trying to figure out where is, I, I think puzzle puzzles, I think spawn code is the script. Oh, cool. That builds that builds the um, 
that builds the puzzle. That's got to be it, right? It's called Spawn so Core. I, I need to shout out uh, Puck90 in the chat. Um, hey, Puck90. Um, Puck90 has a show on Outpost 13, um, mm. and uh, that is called Allison's Sci-Fi Library Super Fun Time. And in it, she reads a science fiction book, uh, chapter by chapter, and it is great. Um, yeah, uh, right now she's in the middle of, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, I should be better, but I'm not. But uh, She can put it in chat, can't she? Can't she, she put it in chat? She can put it in chat, yeah. Uh, in any case, though, uh, check out that show also. It's really cool. Um, yeah. So let's look at this. Um, so how do you do this recursion here? Okay, first of all, what is recursion? Maybe uh, some, some of our audience might not know what, a, what recursion actually is. So recursion um, is something that you get, I guess, in object-oriented programming more than others. Uh, but basically, it's like if you have a function, a function is kind of like a black, think of it as like a black box where you, you actually get these on the SATs. They have them now on the SATs. But it's like, a, think of it as like a mathematical black box. I put some numbers in or an object. It doesn't have to be numbers. It could be a complicated array of numbers or it could be, it could be something from Unity, like it could literally be like a like a, a shape or an image. Uh, but you put, let's say you put a number into this black box and it's in the inside of the function, there are a series of calculations and those calculations run and then it spits out a number at the other end. It spits out some sort of like, this is what I've done to your number. Like, let's say, let's say that like your, your function is sum and it takes two numbers because you can give it you can give it multiple numbers or like an area of numbers. It takes those two numbers, it goes inside, it adds the numbers together, and then it spits out the sum of the two numbers. So that's kind of that's a that's a I guess a, a that's how I would describe a function. It, it it does something. It takes some some information. It does something to the information, and it usually gives you back some more information. Is that a pretty good description, or how would you? Yeah, it's that? a good a good description of a of a function. Uh, from um, I've I've worked with uh, recursive algorithms uh, building a tic tac toe app before, um, but uh, I think my definition is a little different from yours. Um, basically, it's not just any function, but it's a function that calls itself inside of itself. Oh right, yeah, I hadn't yeah. gotten to that part yet. I was just is describing what a function was. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so that's a yeah. So a recursive function calls itself. So if the function is sum, then within that sum function, there would be another function that's called the sum function. And then at a certain point, though, you like that could create an infinite loop. So right. you have to have at a certain point, like. You, there has to be at some point like whatever number it spits out it it's like i'm done i'm done we've gone as, as far deep as we can yeah and then, and it, then it unravels each of those closes out each of the iterations and then the whatever the final and, result yeah. is so. so it spins itself um, up gets gets through all these different steps and then comes back through uh yeah when i was doing um tic-tac-toe i would use minimax to decide whether uh, what the best move was so it would actually traverse the entire game tree using recursion trying to find the best move, um, and then come back and score each of the squares um, with that recursive algorithm, and then select whichever square had the highest score uh, to, uh, to do it. Um, how, how's yours working here, though? I don't know. This might not be where the, because once again, it's been a while since I, I wrote this code. This might not be the where the recursion happens, but I'm taking a look here. So we have a set core puzzle okay. is one function. Right. Um, and then... The spawn uh, core puzzle, I saw that. Um, spawn core function. And um, that's, that's in the name of the function is you named your function spawn core function, right? That is correct. That's okay. the name of the function cool. is spawn core function. Um, and then there's update, which is... Update is just a, like a, that is a... Um, that is a Unity uh, function. There's certain functions that are just for Unity. You need that uh, um, in order for Unity to be able to use this thing. Or correct. Or it's, uh, it's a hook into Unity that allows you to use some of Unity's features inside of your code, right? Yes. Um, now, there are a couple. OK, so let's take a look. Back. Let's go back to the editor really quick, because I noticed that, that one of the things here um, is possibly a script. So there's there's a prefab item called 3ds tune core two, okay. That that is that is um, so we, we should take a look at that because that's a different object. So this is an object. 
Um, okay, uh, that looks like it's sort of like um, the prototype of how any puzzle is built. It's built using these options. Correct. Like these are all the objects that the puzzle is built from. And whether those objects are, are on or off, whether they exist in this space or not, is what the final uh, code determines, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and what color uh... it is. Like, is it red or is it blue? So, But this object is what is called a prefab. And what a prefab is, is an object that is entirely built um, that can be that might have its own code attached to it. This is one of the really cool things I love about Unity. It might have its own code attached to it. Right. It is kind of like a it's an example. It's like a like a template or a platonic ideal of an object yes. that you can attach to another piece of code. Like it could be a spaceship with its own code and its own behaviors and its own and that spawns its own it's, objects. It spawns like, like a, missiles or whatever. And yeah. it's just sitting there. And then like whenever like the the, uh, the spaceship spawning code wants to spawn a spaceship, it grabs it and sticks it into the space. So that's that's what a prefab is. It's like In sitting there and it's like waiting programming uh, that's frequently called a class. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. And so you have different iterations of a class that are exact objects, but they're all conforming to what the class is. And so right, yeah. different objects might turn on or off these squares, but this is the actual prototypical class. If you're talking about starships, you know, galaxy class starship, or um, let's see if I have one over here. I believe this right here is a if I got this right, so the USS Discovery is a cross-field class ship, and there were two of them made. Um, one of them was this, and the other one was the USS Glenn. Um, and they both have the same overarching design, but the class is just the idea, the schematic of what a ship of this class is like. The actual ship is an object. Um, so just because um, uh, Captain Lorca blew up the USS Glenn in an episode of Discovery, spoiler, um, <laughs> uh, then um, it doesn't mean that the USS Discovery has been ex has, has been destroyed as well. You destroyed an object, not the class. And if you want, or even to... the the plans for that type of ship, we right. we can make more of that ship because the plans exist in some database. Right. Somewhere. The plans are a class, and then the actual ships are objects. So that's kind of, that's a big function, that's a, that's a, that's a big key feature of object-oriented programming. Right. So the prefab is a class, and then what it does is it spawns out this puzzle object. Uh -huh. um, and this has a script attached to it too, which is, says pre-made core init. So that is another script. Init, so we'll take a yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's gonna be uh, probably that a constructor, sounds, right? That sounds like the thing that's, that's probably yeah, public going class. to build it. Yeah. Public class. Yeah, so this, yeah. Okay, yeah. This has a ton more code in it. This is like the, the this is where the puzzle I, mean, I know this is where the puzzle building. Yeah, code this is exists. this is probably doing a couple of jobs. Uh, one is to define what the puzzle is, and it probably also um, uh, has some methods in it that arrange itself based off of difficulty levels and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so awake is another, that is another um, piece of code, uh, or, or that is another um, uh, function that is part of Unity. Mm -hmm. And basically what happens is when you instantiate one of these prefab objects, mm -hmm. um, right. any script that is attached to it that has awake, once that script exists, it will run that once. Right. And that's because you've put it into the constructor. Correct. Yeah. If you didn't put it into the constructor, then when you created your object, just like if I was to build another USS Discovery and call it, I don't know, USS Challenger, um, and if I was to have, you know, Challenger go to warp, you know, as a method, it can go to warp, um, then uh, it travels faster than light. But if you put that method right into the constructor, the instant that the object has been completed, it immediately goes to warp. Right. Yeah. So this is stuff like bookkeeping stuff. So like if you wanted to say like, oh, as soon as the, you know, the discovery is, is you know, instantiated, 
I want the photon torpedoes to be loaded so that I can fire them later. So I can fire them right away because I'm going to need them immediately. Well, <laughs> well maybe, maybe immediately, but you might also need them later because generally you don't use the awake function for, for going to warp. You wouldn't necessarily want it's It's kind of like bookkeeping stuff. Yeah. Like, for example, in here, what am I what am I doing here? It looks like I'm going through. I'm going through all of the objects. Um, I'm going through all of the parts, I guess, parts of this component yeah. and i'm doing something to them although i don't really i'm running some yeah sort of and you're you're using a, I'm, I'm seeing a for loop in there um with an iterator yeah. that goes through 70 uh which the number 70 i don't understand um my guess like in in programming terms i would call that a magic number which is that yeah, i think there's 70 of these squares because i think the that, nodes are squares that, and that then seems the connectors yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I had to, I, I could probably figure that out, but it would be really cool if that number 70 actually was described as a variable or a constant, and it was called what that number is, like number of po total possible squares or something like that. And it would just plug that in. So the code yeah, would this is this code is, is horribly, it's horribly commented. But there, there is like there is a comment here, but it is clear. Is obviously it's just me commenting out a piece of code. Is all it is. I yes, put, that's I, correct. That's, yeah. There's no. There's not like uh, some of this is commented. This says use this for initialization. Okay. Well, it's in the initialization function, so that's good. Yeah, I think what I'm doing here is I'm I'm dumping all of the node objects. I'm creating a pointer to them in an array. I think I'm doing yeah. something like that. Probably. Yeah. But, yeah. Know. That seems that 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 sounds plausible um so i can so i can i can i can i can so i can grab them later using node yeah using a call to node um and then start is something that happens i believe start is similar to awake um now i'm noticing something else um this is just a little nitpick and i don't know what this means in c sharp because it's been a little while <laughs> since i've worked in it um so on line 38, you have void start, and you've got a space between start and then the parents. Uh, but then on clear level, on line 48, you don't have that. Um, there's no space. Um, Where is the space you're talking about? So look at... Uh, oh, you mean between... You mean... Between the parentheses and start, and then there's the end. Oh, yeah. No, that's just me being sloppy. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Um, Obviously. Cool. Good. Just wanted to make sure that wasn't something that was important. Nah, it's just syntax that makes no difference, clearly, because it still runs. So. Sure does. Um, uh, and I want to get to a point about that. Like, I know I'm I'm like a stickler for like clean code and you know test driven development and you know um, self documenting code stuff like that. But I mean. Um, no one's going to actually see the code unless they're actually coming in here to work on it. Um, what matters is how it works on the other end. Now, when you have clean code, it can make it easier for you to work with it later on. But um, I, I don't want to turn my nose up at code that isn't written to my extreme snobby standards. <laughs> um, and I'm glad because mine definitely is not. So the, the fact that it works is brilliant. Um, and you clearly like and yeah, you, I mean, you got the thing to do a thing. And it's also really cool to know that this is code that is um, that that sort of um, inspires uh, your usernames, um, which is yeah. Cool. Overdroid is Overdroid has been kind of my handle, my you know my elite username for for years. Um, and other people have, like it always bothers me when I get onto a platform and someone has 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 taken Overdroid. It always bothers me because it's like. I have, I have the website, overdroid.com. Like, I'm, I'm overdroid on Twitter. I'm overdroid on, like, I just, it's like, come on. It's clearly my thing. Like, you're, I think I, I think I have it. You're an internet but. scraper that just goes through every single website that exists and signs you <laughs> into all of them as overdroid, taking that name yeah. as namespace forever for everything. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's funny. I think I've logged on to stuff like like before as Overdroid and then come in and tried and forgotten that I logged in. I was like, someone already has Overdroid. And I'm like, then I recover the password. I'm like, oh, that's me. I have, <laughs> I've, I've taken Overdroid. Okay. But not yeah. other times people have taken the name, which always makes me, makes me a bit grumpy. Mm. Um, 
Well, Joseph, so, uh, it is uh, about time that we start to wrap this up and start to talk uh, about what we learned today. Um, okay. But uh, is I there... just I did want to see if I could figure out where this recur recurring function is. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I'm we can find that. Assuming it's make puzzle. Does this call make puzzle anywhere? This looks po this looks promising. While make puzzle loops is greater than zero, that's a good sign. And it says make loops. That's a <laughs> I, I like that that comment. That's that's fun. <laughs> it's a really clear really clears up a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, make puzzle loops. Uh, scramble puzzle, node wrap. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where the recurring function is. Um, uh, well, you do call, like, uh, um, well, all right, so we've got. I know it's in here somewhere. I know there's a, recur a recur recurring function in here somewhere. I remember, I remember writing it. I remember going, like, I wrote a recurring function for a reason. <laughs> that is always very empowering when you, when you just, when you do something like that. Ah. Yeah. And it is also like deadly complicated uh, if you get it a little wrong because it can like a, a recursive function goes runs away with itself <laughs> if you don't do it. Yes, right. for sure, for sure. Um, I guess it would be something with parentheses after it, right? Uh, yeah, maybe start with those top level um, uh, 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 method definitions that you've got in here. So one say void, one says make puzzle. Uh, you can also do a command F and then look for that name. Yeah, I can search. I just feel like it should be easier. Maybe it is in one of these smaller functions. Scramble puzzle, is it in scramble puzzle? Scramble puzzle doesn't seem to be calling itself. Um, node wrap, ah, well. Uh, there's a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, you can you can get lost in here. Um, uh, and one solution is to just take it chunk by chunk, very deliberately, bit by bit, and then eventually would we would be able to, to, to find it. But if you were to create def make puzzle, yeah, let's see if we can find a make puzzle in here. Wait a minute. Make puzzle loops? No, that's not it. I think that's um, a constant that you have. Yeah. yeah. Make puzzle loops is not, although it sounds like a function because you've named it with a verb, um, I don't think that's actually a, um, it's actually a function. Was it scramble puzzle? Hmm. Anyway, I feel like we could do this for a while, but you wanted to talk about what we learned today, which hopefully is something because um, my code is spaghetti. <laughs> it happens so much. I mean, I go back and look at my code from a couple of years ago, and I'm like, oh, man, who wrote this thing? I can't find anything in here. Um, and it was me. I, I did that. I did that to myself. <laughs> Every bit of code. Just, I think one thing that we can take away from this is that Every bit of software in the world, someone actually wrote. Yeah, that's one that is true. Someone wrote that software. Yeah, I do feel like I was very clever, like the way because I, when I first did this, this was like years ago. I was like, how do I make a puzzle that's solvable? How do I make sure the puzzle is solvable? And I was beating my head against this wall. And it has there's a really obvious solution to it, which I don't know. We'll see if you, if you what would you do even if you wanted to make a puzzle that you knew was solvable. Uh, For certain. I, I would break it into lots of little parts, and I would test drive each of those little parts and make sure that those things always worked. Um, then after that, I think you're trying to do a, like a mathematical algorithm, though, or, or, or something to, to, to solve that problem for yourself. Um, that's tough. Uh, that would take some thinking. But um, uh, There's actually a really, a really easy solution, which is you build a puzzle that's solved. And then you mix it up. That's that's how I solved it. Like you you just take a Rubik's cube, you make a solved Rubik's cube, and you just scramble it. Like, and then oh, you oh, just, well, well it, and and you know because of the fact that you've scrambled the solved version, that that there's an end state there, that is solvable. Right. Yes. That's genius. Yeah. 
I, uh, I, well, I don't know that it's genius, but I feel like that, that was like, when I thought of that, I thought I was like, oh, that's so easy. Why didn't I think of that at the beginning? It's just like, a but, Rubik's yeah. cube. It's just a yeah. really weird Rubik's cube. Now, once you understand that, then yeah, the rest of it just starts to, everything falls into place quite literally. But I do think it's so interesting the way, because it is like the way computer programmers look at, at it. when you're coding, you look at a problem. Because I did for a long time, I was like, I got to figure out a, an algorithm that'll figure out if the puzzle is solvable. How yeah. do I do that? And I was like beating my, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to do that. Why? Well, I, like, it's just, yeah. Start I off just, with like, make, start at the end and you, you start with the desired state and then you move backward. Yes. And yeah. you and and each of your levels are is just you just scrambled it even more. You just went even further scrambling it, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's like a little thing basically cuz all the red cubes are are, you know, the you want to turn it blue so it just like looks at it it'll like first it's a bunch of randomization and then it randomizes it some more until there's enough red cubes and then it's like, well, then that's going to take a while to solve. So that that puzzle is scrambled. That's it. That's, yeah. yeah, and that's where the, your recursion will come in. Uh, it'll come in when it's, you know, the level is how many times to recurse over that function. The function just scrambles it once. And then, yeah. and, and every time you recurse it, you then give it the scrambled puzzle, and then you scramble it again. And then you give it that scrambled, scrambled puzzle, and you scramble it again. <laughs> And maybe, I, maybe, and then it just checks every time until there's enough red cubes, and then it's and like, then, we're done. And then it's like, oh, I scrambled it enough now. All right, cool, good. And then off it goes. But yeah, maybe you also did a thing where it's like, make sure there's enough red cubes. But uh, yeah, that would, if this is essentially a Rubik's cube, which, you know, the way you're describing it, now, like, it makes so much sense. Like, um, yeah, I wonder if we could see, like, a complicated, like, a more, um, a later version of the puzzle. There's a way to. Where is the? Hmm. Somewhere there's like a an object that determines what level it's on. Good nodes, active nodes, end level. Where is it? There's like a. Might be in the player item hmm but you could see for example the player object yeah uh has these pr these prefabs right like whenever i whenever i in the game fire a bullet it's instantiating a bullet object right right because it has this zappy bullet right <laughs> it's object. building a bullet and then um as soon as it is built it fires it right and the bullet itself has a code attached to it that like if it travels far enough it just disappears Right. Yeah. So that way you don't end up um, creating memory leaks by having all these bullets zapping off into the distance and having the computer still keeping track of them when they absolutely don't matter. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how. There's a way so in here. Somewhere there's like a, that's not it. There's an object that has the level Oh, there it is. So if we turn this up to 80, and then I solve the puzzle, let's see, it should give a more complicated puzzle for the next one. Yeah, see, this puzzle is much more complicated, and there's a lot more attached things, right? Oh, see yeah. that? So you got to figure out how do I, how do I get these all to be blue? How do I, you know what I mean? There's a way to do it because it started from a solved state, obviously. Right. You know. And that means that you can always, you, 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 you know that you didn't do that wrong because yeah. it had to start from a solved state. Right. Huh. Well, that's really cool. Um, so I don't want to keep you too much too, too late because uh, I know you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I do have a couple of questions for you. Okay. All right. Uh, one. Um, what's the most important thing to remember about developing software? Oh, oh yeah, you told me what these questions were at the beginning, and I don't <laughs> think I really even thought of an answer for them. Uh, I think what's the most important thing about developing software? I think it's that get in there and get dirty. I feel like a lot of people feel like they're going to break the computer mm -hmm. by by coding it, and it's like, no, this is about, it's Tinker Toys, man. Get in there and and 
and build some stuff and let it fail like just like improv like fail to learn you know what i mean like yeah. you're not gonna break the machine you're not gonna break the machine play with some stuff see what it, if it goes into an infinite loop and you have to reboot that's that's fine like you, you know what i mean like it'll be okay it'll be okay that's i think the most important thing yeah yeah totally um yeah can't that's one of the other reasons why i say like clean code is one thing but um it's more important to get your hands dirty first you can clean it up afterwards clean it up afterwards yeah yeah um all right second thing um if someone wanted to get started with developing games with unity or just software in general where should they begin on the internet I mean, you can you, you can teach yourself anything from the internet. Like for Unity, they have like a series of videos you can watch. Yeah. They want people to use Unity. You, right. The people who develop Unity, that's the other thing is like there's a whole series of tutorials. If you want to learn Unity, you can start in the very basic. They'll explain this development environment. They'll explain what everything is, you know, and, and just walk you through it all. Um, and yeah, and eventually you'll be learning writing functions in, in C Sharp by and the end of it. If you get good, good enough at it, uh, which, you know, all you have to do is just apply it enough um, yeah. and learn, learn it enough. Uh, and if you wanted to get a job doing that, there are people who will pay a lot of money uh, because you spent your time going through those tutorials, which were free. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, like I said, there's a big, uh, like, there's a ton of people out there. There's a huge environment of people out there who will, um, you know, uh, who help you out. You can even ask on forums, like, mm -hmm. if you're not sure how something works. If you can't find the answer somewhere, you can ask, and there'll be people who will answer you within a day, yeah. if I, not sooner. I mean, if I, I can't tell you how many times I've relied on that myself and how much that, because of the fact that I rely on that, I give back too. Uh, and I'm, you know, not alone in the world of software developers who, you know, dedicate themselves to teaching other people. Um, you know, just about anybody is, you know, if they've got a few minutes, they'll, they'll, they'll spend it, you know, helping you out. So. True, true. Yeah. Of course, you got to put in your own work. I mean, nobody's going to eat your lunch for you. No, and I think, like, do a little bit every day. Like, every day you should, you know, just spend a little time on stuff. And you're going to have to learn some math, too. That's the other thing is you can't be afraid of math. But, you know, start out, you can you can go to, like, um, like Khan Academy and just do some, you know, learn just a bit of algebra really is yeah. all you need. You don't need you don't need to know what trigonometry. You don't need to know trigonometry. But you no. do need to know, like, basic algebra, you know, the plus minus division and you know having some variables in there yeah when but i first started i was thinking yeah. like oh I, I i should learn calculus and oh. do you know that i did not learn calculus good I, yeah calculus is hard to totally <laughs> unnecessary and to describe that in code again not particularly necessary for me right now <laughs> um at some point if i need it i now have enough confidence in my ability to learn things that i can actually go in and do it but i've yeah. had no need to do that so yeah, you don't need nearly as much math as you think you do. Um, yeah, I'd say that uh, naming things really well and trying to write it as if it is prose will help you out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I could do. I could definitely do more of that, yeah. <laughs> as we've seen from looking at my code today. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, uh, I have some people to thank uh, at the end of this episode. So let me go ahead and do that. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, my production liaison is Matt Pittner. Um, uh, thank you, Outpost13. Uh, uh, my designer is Aaron Harvey, uh, who has a show called Infinite Trek. It's on Saturdays. Uh, they've been going through, um, they're, they're just about to start uh, Discovery Season 3. I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, my marketer, Lu Lucas Spinosik, who is away right now, but frequently you can find him on Two Liars, which is on on uh, Thursdays. Uh, Botmaster's Cody Bushy, he has a show called An Actor Unprepared. Um, that is a great show if you want to see into the acting process um, and uh, you get an actor, a director, and a writer, and they create a piece right there on the spot. Um, and the music is uh, by Arlo Sanders and Alex Kahn, who uh, have um, a Spotify channel called Made Up Music, where they have made up music here on the channel uh, to do that. So. Uh, Joseph also has a show on the channel, um, and not just one, he's had several. Um, he may have more in the future, who knows what the future <laughs> may hold. Um, but I do know that he, ha he is co-host on the I Effing Love Whiskey pod er, podcast and show. Uh, 
Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell what that show is like already. Um, so, That's a good one. Joseph, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and Thanks uh, for having me, Ian. Yeah. I had a lot of fun. You're right. such a smart dude, and I love that you love coding. You know, I love that you love whiskey and that you do game development and that you have been so nice to me in so many ways. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm in great company. Um, but yeah, uh, now is the time uh, at the end of the show when uh, we have a very awkward goodbye that usually happens at the end of any software call. So. Let's try and make it as awkward as possible. Are you, are you ready? I'm, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to shut this thing down. Uh, all right. All right. Hold on. Wait. Uh, okay. Uh, are we... Oh, are we, did we... Is it... Are we done? Or? Hold on. I need to mute us both now. Uh, the the oh, video is okay. on, but we're still not muted. Okay. Oh, that's... Um, okay, well, I guess uh, talk to you next time. Or... Oh, yeah, yeah. I... Was there another... No, oh. there's not. All right, bye.